I was just telling these guys has been kind of a on my radar for a long time. Um, it's clearly a cutting edge design company and we're thrilled that they're here to do the workshop for you all on business design and business design. For those of you who are pitching in the morning, one of the um, audience voted prizes will actually be a session with IDEO with their Craftworks. Um, they have a, a little kind of mini product. So one of you can potentially win um, some time with 10 of their designers, is that about right? Uh, just a group -ish. The group, yeah, usually 10 to 15. Something like that, so a lot of great <laughs> feedback. So anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to um, these two gentlemen to introduce themselves, but thank you for thanks. joining us today. Hey, thanks. thanks for having us. Um, David Aiken, this is Joe Gerber. We're both uh, business designers at IDEO. Um, and as you may know, uh, IDEO is a design and innovation firm. Um, our business design group really focuses on applying the creative process and human-centered design to thinking about venturing and designing um, whole businesses. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of some of the methods that we use uh, towards that. Um, but let's start out with just simply thinking about what is design, um, which is you know a pretty big question. So people have started to use the word in a lot of different ways, um, and really it's making things look beautiful, right? Well, that is part of it, and it's part that we really do embrace at IDEO, um, but that's really just a small part of it. Um, really, it's the process of, of um, defining holistic and considered solutions, right? Anything that we create in the world has many different factors that it has to play with. Um, there's many different experts that might provide value and thoughtful input towards what that is, and there's many different ways that a concept might come and be, in, and, and be brought into the world. And, and we believe that by considering many of these factors, not jumping to conclusions about them, but really considering them elegantly, we can come up with great, great things. Um, so we really want to make lives better, more delightful, um, bring joy to the world, bring utility to people. Um, that's, you know, most of us as design kind of come in through aesthetics. We have this idea of like wanting to create beauty in the world or being attracted to beautiful, great things. Um, and that's all well and good and idealistic. Um, but we also need to sustain these solutions with robust business models. They have to make money if we want to keep them around in the world. Um, they have to, you know, have a long-term strategy. They have to differentiate. They have to work technically. So, they really have to be holistic. They have to be holistically considered. And in the simplest level, this means that people have to want to engage. Customers have to fork over their money willingly to engage with this customer, whether that's a, you know, a, business, um, uh, a business procurement department or a, an end consumer. Uh, it has to work, um, and it has to, be, it has to be a working, functioning business. Um, so that's pretty easy to agree on, but really the challenge is, is getting there and getting to that center, and that's really difficult. And so that's what, that's what IDEO really kind of prides itself on doing. So really the magic to IDEO is, is its people. Um, it's that we're a multidisciplinary group. Uh, we have engineers, we have food scientists, we have psychologists, we have ethnographists. Um, we have engineers, we've got business designers, we've got industrial designers. Um, and we put these people together. We have a core, small, tight team who serves as the hub of a lot of knowledge and, and information. And we put them to work on these problems, and they extend even beyond. And they tap our client networks and other experts at IDEO. And, and they pull in all this inspiration and insight. And they, they create, they hold that vision um, and, and craft that vision and consider uh, what that should be and, and sort of spiral into that middle of that holistic vent. So it really is about the people and the interplay between the people. Um, and our, you know, little quick attempt to gain some credibility here is that, you know, a lot of big clients like to work with us and a lot of these um, clients who are actually well known for design, we like to take a little bit of credit for having helped them create some of the elegant solutions that they've put out in the world. Um, and, you know, we put up a lot of sort of big corporate brands here because they're the most identifiable, but we also work with startups, nonprofits, governments. Um, the process of design, we really think, applies to all of these. It's really um, a toolkit for solving problems, period. Um, and we truly believe it applies to, to anything. So a couple examples here. Um, 
we recently help uh, help Walgreens sort of rethink what the pharmacy is. Um, and as robotics increasingly take over kind of the back end of the pharmacy, um, you know, they've got all this talent um, and expensive talent at that. And instead of just saying, hey, well, let's just get rid of these people, we thought about, well, what could we do with them? How could we rethink about what that, how that expertise might be brought to bear um, on that industry? And so um, what we've helped Walgreens do is do a push um, towards pharmacists actually helping people with their health care and using their expertise in a more consultative way with people who come into the store, along with a number of other um, innovations. So allowing them to create a closer connection to their customers and um, ha having people get a more accessible way of, of dealing with their health. Working on the venture side, um, we worked with a, um, a major media company, um, Gannett Papers, who uh, has a number of sort of old school uh, newspapers to rethink what it means to um, create a new media business model on a local level um, and to launch that through a small venture, a small team, building a business from, from scratch um, responsible for its own p &L. Um, and what we're really proud of on this is not only do we create a profitable business model that allows um, authentic creations between local connections between local merchants and, and readers, um, but we really built a learning organization. We, we experimented with new business models, um, but we, didn't, we, didn't, we knew we didn't have all the answers right, so we actually built in the learning mechanism of how they would go out, continue reaching out to merchants, their customers, um, and ensure that they were engaging them and building a solid and, and vibrant business. So, I think what we really want to do now is just share some tips about how, how we kind of bring this to life, right? Because again, those three circles, we all know, and people need to love it, it needs to work, it needs to be a viable business. But getting there is, is really hard. So a few tips that we use, and it seems to work for us quite a lot. We have this notion of design-driven strategy. Um, so the traditional model of strategy is you kind of, you sit there and you, you know, you've got a new business idea and you kind of pontificate and you theorize about what your strategic opportunity is. Or executives sit around in corporate boardrooms saying, well, what, what's our, you know, what's our two by two? What's our corner of the market that we're going to play on? And then they just sort of send that out into the organization or they just begin implementing on that with the assumption that it's correct. Um, and we really believe that strategy doesn't come purely before building and doing. That actually you have to validate your strategy by putting tangible things out in the world. So at IDEO, what we do a lot is we prototype. We don't spend a ton of time in the area of strategizing and theorizing. We come up with a number of strategic hypotheses, and then we build tangible prototypes, and we draw tangible experiences of what that means out in the world. And we go out and we start to evaluate them with, with consumers, with stakeholders, and we start to assess our assumptions. And then we go back and we see how our strategy might need to change in order to be as relevant as it might be. <coughs> The major part of design is creating meaning through principles. Um, there's a lot of things that you could do out in the world. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of potential opportunity. There's a lot of ways to make money. A great way to create some focus is to actually have some principle to understand what your brand should mean. What do you want to mean? What, is, what should um, really resonate with consumers? And so we'll play around in early stages with many different ways um, that we might be relevant in the market. And there's a combination of finding new opportunities through research and talking to consumers and understanding markets. There's also an internal part that comes out in terms of what do you want to be about, right? What, is, what are you actually passionate about doing? What's going to harness the passion of your founding team or your new hires um, or, your, um, or your, you know, your corporate um, employees? And so um, this is an example from that um, bold italic offer, the new media offer for, for Gannett. Um, and at sort of a mid-stage of, of, of going through that process where we would, um, we looked at all the assumptions that media players were making in the world today and we, we started to think about, well, where are our new trends? Where are things starting to take off that might be interesting? Where are people making assumptions about what media should be? And can we be a little contrary and actually turn those on their head? So we have a number of these principles and, and um, that we might choose to explore and that we can actually generate ideas from. So, for example, one of them was the idea of the subjective, right? Old school journalist um, newspaper, it's all about weighing all sides of the story um, and being completely objective and writing yourself out of the story. Well, when people want to explore their own neighborhood, that's not exactly a valuable principle. They want 
point of view. They want to learn about their neighborhood from someone like them or someone who they aspire to be. Um, they might even accept that individual writer writing themselves into the story. So that gives us an avenue to say, well, this could be an interesting principle of our venture, and what would that venture look like? And now we can start to explore that option and see if we can create something with traction. So coming off that is the idea of exploring options. Um, if there's one thing that we see time and time again, particularly with, with um, new ventures, is this idea of they just sort of pick an idea and go and they build. And, and there's, a lot to, there's a lot of credit in that. Um, there's two major flaws to it. One is that you very quickly get anchored in your own assumptions. Um, there's a lot of knowledge nowadays and, and a lot of um, theory about lean startup, which we actually advocate for quite a lot. What people often underestimate is the difficulty of a pivot down the road. You, um, particularly once you've really invested, and even just after a few weeks of really investing an idea, it's really hard to reassess your assumptions of how you got there, and it's really hard to say, I'm gonna do something really different. So what we suggest is actually at really low fidelity, thinking about that value you wanna create or those principles you might wanna act on, but find a lot of smaller, quicker vectors to explore how you might do that and to bring those out in front of consumers. So two things that helps you do is free yourself up from your initial assumptions, which might be wrong, and also get a lot better feedback when you start thinking, bringing things out into the world and bringing them in front of consumers and bringing them in front of other experts. Because people really don't want to tell you that your one idea is terrible, but they're okay telling you between six which one's better and which one's worse and which one really kind of makes their eyes light up. The other thing is to shift focus. So there's a lot of things at that intersection of those, those three circles. Um, and our human brains can only kind of digest so much at once. But as we said, a core team, a founding team, a, a visionary team um, needs to actually be responsible for all of those elements. And so the way they can actually dive deep in that is to actually switch modes and say, well, today we're going to focus on this type of thinking, and tomorrow we're going to think about that, and to cycle through those. And actually, we think a good place often to start for ventures is at the brand level, to be what are you passionate about, what's the purpose you want to create in the world, and let's start to move from there. From there, we can say, well, what's the offer or the experience? What's the value that we want to create for people? And what are different ways to deliver that value? What's the experience that the consumer has that exposes them to that value? And from there, with those options, we can start to say, well, how do we make a business out of those? When we squint at those, can we make the economics work? Is there something new and differentiated that we as a team feel we can build, um, do really well and put out in the world? And what does it mean to build an organization that does that? And to cycle through these um, until, and with options throughout until you're, you're honed into something that you have a lot of evidence works. So as we're cycling and iterating, as a bunch of these diagrams say, um, what's really challenging is to remember to keep it rough early. Because you can literally explore dozens of concepts in a week. You can explore hundreds of concepts in a week if you can stay at that level of low fidelity. Sketches of user experiences, um, quick product sketches, um, you know, quick physical prototypes built with tape and foam. Um, these are th all props that you can kind of use to have these discussions. Um, quick sketches of a supply chain that you can have with a supply chain expert. You know, all of these things allow you to explore a broad number of provocations quickly. So people usually stay extremely in the abstract early. And then when they decide that they've got a product idea, they start to think about you know, real high fidelity objects that really look and feel like they are. And it, takes, it can take them months to get there. So think about the idea of early on exploring dozens of ideas in a week. And how would you do that? And how could you keep things low enough fidelity to do that? Focus on business risks. So there's a lot of different types of risks, and Joe in a moment is going to go over sort of the business, um, the business model canvas as sort of a catch-all for the assumptions um, that we think through when designing a business. Um, back in the day of IDEO, we always used to really kind of focus on usability and desirability early in our prototyping. Um, but what we really found is the business model canvas is actually a great place to capture all of your, your risks and assumptions and to back up and say, hey, well, what here that I filled out in my vision of my business do I truly know, and what have I actually kind of just made a total swag on? And on all those things that I don't really know, where is getting those elements really, really critically wrong um, 
going to really mess up my business and, and my opportunity. And so, and think about what are the quick and dirty ways that you can get a lot more confidence in those domains. And that's actually where we're going to spend a good amount of our workshop time on later. Collaboration, again, as we express and sort of is the key to IDO's really success. The idea that, you know, your team and the people you work with are everything. Um, and if you can really trust that the people you work with bring a different opinion than you, um, but that you're both intelligent people, and when you hear different ideas, that you're not just pushing them down and, and saying, well, here's why I don't think they work, but actually, if Joe has the idea, I, well, he must have some intelligent reason for that. So I'm actually going to try and build and contribute to that idea <laughs> until you know we actually together agree that we should either go forward and, and prototype that or we should just cut it now and we're not going to explore that any further. For I don't know how many of you are sort of MBAs or engineers here in the room, but this is something that MBAs and engineers have a really hard time with, the idea of start early and wrong. Get those straw men up. Get your earliest assumptions just out there, just kind of vomit them out on a page and start showing them to people, right? Because you're going to learn so much so quickly. You know, that's the main thing that I kind of coach new business designers with when they come to IDEO is they want to kind of hole off in a corner and make a perfect financial model or do all this perfect um, research about the competitive landscape and sort of show this shining thing to everybody. Um, and instead, it's like, well, do, do the one-hour version of that. Do the two-hour version, and then go talk to people who know better. Talk to industry experts. Talk to a technical expert. Um, and particularly for entrepreneurs, it's just so much more valuable to get these ideas out and get an expert opinion on them than to sort of protect something that's probably got a lot of critical flaws embedded in it. Just, just to add to that, when, when I first started IDEO, I thought prototyping was about validating assumptions. And, and especially early in the process, it's actually, you know you're wrong. You're, you're absolutely wrong. Like, there's no way that you got it all right the first time. And what's more important, what's more useful for you at that point in the, in the process is to understand, like, what did I get wrong? So the pro you're, you make a prototype to break it. And you, and you figure out where did, where did it break, and then you fix that part, right? And you make another one, and it breaks, and you fix that part. So it's, it's about accepting the fact that you're wrong and embracing it and keeping going. So prototyping is not about always about validation. Like, if you if you take a prototype to a, a user and they say, like, "Oh, I love it. It's great." Like, then what do you do next? You don't know. But if they're like, "I would never share this because um, of privacy concerns or you know whatever," then you then you have something to to start to design around. Finally, you know, the idea of creating authenticity in your business is a great tool that we use. Um, <coughs> over and over. And this is actually a framework that's repurposed. Our original use for this is um, to actually more completely understand the consumer and to, um, and to figure out the, the, the drivers of their sort of what they actually do and what they say, which are often very different, um, and try to extract from that, well, what do they think and what do they feel? This is also a place where our assumptions break down, so prototyping them helps. What we've actually really found is trying to, to using this framework as applied to a new venture or a corporation is really helpful to, draw, to drive a successful business. So we all focus when we, do, when we talk about a business of what does the business do, right? Like what does it create? What does it put out into the world? How does it you know, treat its customers? Um, and we know about how business market themselves. And already there, I think most of us will say a lot of businesses have a pretty major gap between what they're telling people, how they say they're going to help them, and what they actually do. So an, an area to really tie together that authenticity. What you really want also on the back end is strategic decision-making frameworks that help you do this stuff well, <laughs> and those passion igniting elements that make you care and put the effort in for your business, make it easier to hire people and make them care and work hard for you. So this notion of authenticity is actually a great way to kind of build an organization and think about building a business. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joe, who's going to talk a bit about business model canvas which we're actually going to use. Cool. So I'm going to jam through uh, the business model canvas and show some examples of how you can design different elements of that. And then we're going to try it ourselves. So the first assertion is the business model is, is kind of the cohesive unit of design. And what we mean by that is whether you're designing a, a brand identity or a product or experience, those, those are all parts of fundamentally parts of a business and you're designing them because you, you probably want that business to grow and, and be 
profitable. So a few examples of how you might design business. So this is offering design, and, and really this is about how do you design for value creation. So you can think about your value proposition and who your customers are, and what basically what's that promise to your customers. Uh, operations design, so thinking about um, what capabilities do you have or need to develop, who are, who are your partners who are going to augment those capabilities, and how do you and what are the channels that in, through which you develop, deliver those capabilities? This is kind of uh, designing for kind of value delivery, right? Economics design, uh, as David pointed out the other day, uh, not not two words you usually see together, but this is about kind of how do you how do you um, think through the, the relationship between your cost model and your pricing model. And it's not just about uh, creating a product and then slapping on some pricing at the end. It's about thinking about the interplay between um, the constraints of, OK, if I want to deliver this experience and it has these cost implications, uh, what, what, like, what can I do with that? And maybe I need to start to think about a different experience. or. Um, or from a from a revenue model perspective, is this like is this a la carte? Is it subscription? As you start to consider those things, it has impact on what you're actually delivering in market. And if you consider that earlier, you might have a more robust or elegant business model. One other point on this, I'd say, like there's a lot of dysfunction in terms of how like financial analysis and economic thinking is applied in in venture environments, corporate environments, and somehow this role seems to have gotten this like status where they can kind of sit back and wait and like ideas can just come to them and they can do the analysis and kind of give everyone the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And we just think it's another element that helps you figure out what a sensible thing to do is. And so, you know, we, we work really hard to work with our clients early on when things are still really foggy and, and mushy and say, well, let's squint at this and see how, what does it mean when we sketch the economics of this business, right? The industrial designers there sketching a product, the you know, experienced designers sketching the user experience, those things aren't right. Well, we need to be in there sketching with them too and figuring out how, how the economics of this thing might come together because all of these things are going to co-inform each other. It's really a waste of a lot of time to do all this other effort, not think about the finances, and then say, you know, does it work or does it not once everyone's put a lot of hard work into it. Uh, so marketing design, this is about kind of how do you communicate the value that you've created? Um, and so you're thinking about the value proposition, the channels, the pricing, and, and the customers, and where are those customers? Um, so, you know, like what sorts of behaviors are you trying to incentivize with this offer, and how do you communicate the offer in, in the right ways? So, the the kind of the the sum <coughs> summation point is to make it elegant. And we have a quick example. Um, our critique of the business model canvas is that. It's great for codifying the elements of your business, and as David mentioned, surfacing assumptions that you're making, and, and we'll do that. Um, but that point that we just made about economics design, like the real, the real design and the real challenge of creating a business model is actually in the interplay between all of these different elements. And so um, getting all of these elements out and then thinking about how, like what are the interactions between these pieces and how can you make them better or, or, or even remove mechanical pieces out of the model to make it to make it better is is kind of what we we strive for uh, Zara is a quick example it's a it's a fast fashion retailer out of Spain um, and one thing that they I, we think they do really well is they focus on one thing that and get that right and then that elegantly influences other pieces of their business model so they have this core capability in fast fashion so they identify trends they can, they can spin up uh, uh, a new line really quickly. And um, to do that, and that has implications on their cost model, for example. So uh, one, they're operating at scale because they've, they've kind of, they're only picking things that already have high levels of demand. And two, they, they loosen the constraints of uh, what, the, what the requirements are for producing those products. They kind of offload that to their partners and say like, look, this dress needs to be orange because this color is what's actually driving popularity right now. What the actual fabric is or the type of thread, you, you can source that locally and figure that out. Um, 
they, their pricing model is also influenced by this. So because they're, they're uh, rotating their stock and their offering on, I think, a, a three week, two, three weeks. two to three week basis, um, although they're, they're uh, at a slight discount to kind of high fashion brands, they have a more stable pricing, uh, more stable pricing power because people know that in three weeks there's going to be something different there and they're not going to get this stuff on sale like you might at another retailer. Uh, and then finally, uh, because they're rotating their, their stock so quickly, their stores become a really in, important channel. You know that every time you go to the store, there's going to be something new. If you're kind of somebody who goes to the mall and, and goes to check out stores, you're always going to stop at Zara, and therefore, you don't need to spend as much money on advertising and, and marketing. So that's, that's, an interest, that's just a, a one example of like how you do one thing right, and it kind of has ripple effects throughout the rest of the model, um, and, you can, and you can be really smart about how you do that. All right, you guys ready to do this? Maybe, okay. <laughs> so we're gonna do three activities really quickly. Um, we're gonna kind of just define the customer and the value proposition. And, and we're kind of walking through the business model creation process and way too fast, but that's okay. It kind of proves that you can do this quickly and then keep iterating. Um, so that's about value creation, basically. Then there's about, then the next piece is how are you going to deliver that value? What is kind of the operational back end in order to deliver that, that experience or that product sustainably? Uh, and then once you've kind of laid it out there on the canvas, we're going to say, we're going to cir circle the key risks. So what do you feel most discomfort with in, the, in that model? Um, and then we'll have you design an experiment. And that, that experiment could be something that you uh, build a prototype of some, some fidelity, probably low fidelity, and take out into the world and test with the right people. Make sense? So also just quickly, I mean, I, from my understanding, everyone's at sort of different stages with their startups and ventures. So obviously, if you've got the first two as a solid hypothesis and you can just write that out quickly, you know, that's great. Spend more time on the experiment design. We're going we're gonna to kind of march through it roughly at this pace. Um, and as we do it, yeah, if you have questions, just kind of put your hand up. We'll be happy to kind of walk around and chat with you. So as you think about value proposition, uh, keep end customer. Keep in mind, is your is your customer and the and the end user, the consumer, the same person? A lot, a lot of times, people mess that up. Uh, key is what is the context of need. So when when does that need occur? Where does it occur, and why? And that'll come back to be really important once we get to experiment design, because when you're prototyping the the better you can mimic context, the higher fidelity, the, the higher resolution and, and more uh, valuable the data you get back from that experience, experiment is. Uh, so what problem are you solving for them and why will they choose you? That's, that's kind of like a restatement of, of value proposition. 